This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Invasive intracranial pressure monitoring, or ICP monitoring, is often used in patients in whom elevated intracranial pressure is suspected, particularly those with traumatic brain injury. The two most common tools used for invasive ICP monitoring are intraparenchymal ICP monitors and external ventricular drains. Each has its own benefits and drawbacks. This video describes the insertion of an intraparenchymal ICP monitor. Although these monitors do not allow for therapeutic drainage of cerebral spinal fluid, they are more straightforward to place, particularly if there is ventricular effacement or displacement, which is common in patients with traumatic brain injury. Intraparenchymal monitors are also associated with fewer complications, such as hemorrhage and ventriculitis, than external ventricular drains. Guidelines on the use of invasive ICP monitors vary, but the Brain Trauma Foundation recommends their insertion in patients with severe traumatic brain injury and abnormalities on computed tomography, or CT, and in selected patients with a normal CT scan. Invasive ICP monitors can also be used in patients with other conditions associated with elevated intracranial pressure. Insertion of an intracranial monitor should be avoided in patients with coagulopathy. Also, ICP monitors should be inserted at a site that is away from any local infection. Several types of intraparenchymal ICP monitors are available, including piezoelectric strain gauges, fiber optic monitors, and pneumatic monitors. These monitors can be inserted through a skull bolt or tunneled under the skin. In this video, we will describe the insertion of a piezoelectric strain gauge through a skull bolt, but the principles of insertion are similar for all types of intraparenchymal ICP monitors. Begin by gathering the necessary equipment. For the initial preparation, you will need non-sterile gloves, a water-absorbent underpad, water, soap, a washcloth or brush, a hand towel, a razor, and a marker pen. For the procedure itself, you will need a face mask, a sterile gown and sterile gloves, an antiseptic solution such as chlorhexidine, a sterile fenestrated drape, a local anesthetic agent such as 2% lidocaine with 1 in 200,000 adrenaline, a 5 mil syringe, a 21 gauge needle for drawing up the anesthetic and a 27 gauge needle for administering the anesthetic, a scalpel with a number 11 blade and an ICP monitoring kit. The kit should contain a twist drill with a drill bit, a bolt, an ICP sensor and a transducer. Finally, you will need some suture material such as a 3.0 nylon and a sterile dressing. Don non-sterile gloves. Place the patient in a supine position and put the water absorbent underpad beneath the patient's head with the plastic side down. Wash the patient's scalp with soap and clean water using the washcloth or brush. Dry the skin with a hand towel and shave as necessary. Identify the anatomical landmarks and mark the incision site. Generally, ICP monitors are inserted on the side of the non-dominant hemisphere, which is usually the right side. The incision is made along the mid-pupillary line, 3 cm lateral to the midline to avoid the sagittal sinus, approximately 11 cm posterior to the nasion and at least 1 cm anterior to the coronal suture to avoid the motor strip. Put on a face shield, wash and disinfect your hands, and don a sterile gown and sterile gloves. If you are using a drill guide, loosen the guide with a hex wrench. Place it at a suitable depth, typically approximately 20 mm, and then retighten it. Thick skull and scalp hematomas may obviate the need for a drill guide. Prepare the autoclave twist drill by placing the bit into the chuck, holding the drill handle in place, and then turning the chuck clockwise. Prepare the bolt by placing the stylet in the lumen with the tip exposed. In most adult patients, the spacing washer is unnecessary and may be discarded. Wipe the frontal area three times from the centre to the periphery with an antiseptic solution. Then, place a sterile fenestrated drape over the head. Larger sterile drapes may also be used, but follow local guidelines. Raise a bleb with local anaesthetic.
Make a short 5mm linear stab incision. Use of a retractor is usually unnecessary. Ask an assistant to secure the patient's head. Place the drill perpendicular to the skull and turn the handle clockwise. Do not lean on the drill. You will usually be able to feel the drill bit penetrate the hard outer cortex, the soft central medulla and the hard inner cortex. Place the bolt in position perpendicular to the skull and turn it clockwise, usually nine half turns until it is secure. Loosen the cap of the bolt by turning the adapter counterclockwise and make a puncture in the dura using the dural puncture stilet. Cerebral spinal fluid may be visible at this point. Switch on the ICP transducer. Place the ICP sensor in sterile water and ask an assistant to connect the sensor to the transducer. Ask the assistant to calibrate the transducer and record the reference number. Insert the ICP sensor through the bolt to the desired depth, which is often approximately 15 millimeters into the cranium, and then secure the sensor in the bolt by turning the adapter clockwise. When a strain gauge is used, a bend may be placed in the sensor at the desired depth, but other types of sensors should not be kinked. Dress the wound site using antiseptic soaked gauze. You may place a purse string suture, which can aid in wound closure after the bolt is removed. Hemorrhage can occur at any stage of the procedure, but is seldom clinically significant. Before the procedure, identify and correct any coagulopathy. A scalp or skull hemorrhage usually terminates once the bolt is placed, but skin sutures and bone wax may be applied if bleeding persists. Intracranial hemorrhage is rare, but unenhanced CT of the head may be performed after the procedure if hemorrhage is suspected. Infection is a rare but serious late complication. Ensure adequate preparation and meticulous aseptic technique. Avoid handling the tip of the ICP sensor. The use of periprocedural antibiotic agents may be considered but follow local guidelines if you decide to administer them. CT of the head with and without the administration of contrast material may be requested and a cerebral spinal fluid sample may be obtained if there is concern about intracranial abscess or ventriculitis. Normal intracranial pressure is 7 to 15 millimeters of mercury. The upper limit of the normal range is 20 millimeters of mercury. Gentle pressure over the jugular veins should cause a rise in intracranial pressure. The rate at which the intracranial pressure rises may indicate the degree of compliance of the brain. If there is no increase in intracranial pressure, then check the waveform. An ICP waveform consists of several peaks, P1, P2 and P3, that may be considered to be the combination of the arterial and other waveforms. In cases in which the ICP waveform is not present, check the ICP sensor and transducer. Technical malfunction or loss of calibration of the ICP sensor can lead to inaccurate readings. For cases in which the intracranial pressure is no longer consistent with clinical and radiologic findings, the ICP sensor may need to be replaced. Intraparenchymal ICP monitoring is often useful for patients in whom elevated intracranial pressure is suspected, particularly in those with traumatic brain injury. Meticulous technique is important to reduce the risk of complications such as hemorrhage and infection.